What's up, what's up everybody? Welcome in to the CFBpod.com show. We're going to be joined by Brandon Moore in just a second, but it's myself and Dave Shoemate right now. Dave, how you doing this evening, my man? Good, Blaine. How's, how's everything going with you, man? Oh, uh, excited, excited to just be talking ball as always. So Absolutely. go ahead, everybody that tunes in. We're going to be talking college football all year long. So you need to go ahead and do the first thing and go ahead and subscribe to that channel. We've had a lot of momentum here lately. We want to keep it going. So go ahead and su subscribe to the channel. Totally free. Helps us out and allows us to keep making more content for you guys. Also, hit that thumbs up button. That would be greatly appreciated as well. And Dave, you've worked in uh, in college football programs. You know that this thing is a pressure cooker. And that's what we're talking about this evening is pressure on some certain programs across college football and before we get into the specific ones i just want you to kind of talk about from some of your contacts and, and and what we're seeing right now with you know things like chip kelly leaving a head coaching position to go be a coordinator and all these guys at the college ranks leaving and going to the nfl stuff like that just talk about the the quality of life for these coaches and then also the expectations that are placed upon them yeah i mean i think it initially just comes down to quality of life from the standpoint the good thing they did the NCAA is make February dead I think that would be a total chaos if you were trying to play in a recruiting weekend the Saturday after signing day like it used to be but I just think it's the schedule is more concrete in the NFL there's never a pop-up of hey there's a seven on seven team coming to coming through Gainesville at eight o'clock on a Saturday night just because they were in some tournament in Orlando just it's recruiting I mean it, Anybody who follows college football knows that 24-7, 365, whereas the NFL, you're literally doing what these guys got into it in the first place to get into coaching, have an impact on these guys, get into coaching, the true X's and O's, stuff like that. We're just it's the demand now between not only just recruiting, which is a lot already with, with the calendar, but now just the retention, the retaining of your, ro your own roster, uh, getting outbid by some people that maybe some outside of some stuff that's outside of your control, um, so I think it's kind of, I think it's stuff like that. It's kind of pushing these guys to, uh, the NFL. You're right. The, the Chip Kelly one, the head coach in the same conference as, uh, as Ohio state, UCLA going to Ohio state head coach going to be a coordinator. That's crazy. I mean, I know there was some film familiarity and we did a video on the breakdown of that. If people want to go check it out, the Ohio state breakdown and Chip Kelly going over there, but that, that, that's an intriguing one too. I think it, from a different standpoint, it's a little bit of, Hey, I think he was done, tired of being the CEO. He'd been the CEO with the Eagles, Oregon. I think God just wanted to get back to calling plays, getting back to what yeah. he wanted to do with the weapons he has now at Ohio State. For sure, having some fun. And listen, there's a lot of these guys that we're going to talk about tonight that are high energy guys. They put a lot of effort into it. But sometimes, you know, it's it's multiple situations. Sometimes pressure is because you haven't lived up for expectations. And sometimes pressure is because you've done a good enough job to warrant people having higher expectations of you, and, and that's in different situations on both of these. But I wanted to start off with a team out of the Big 12 and that whole new landscape out of the Big 12. Let's let's start off with Texas Tech over there in Lubbock. Let's talk about Joey McGuire. He goes 8-5 and five first year, really set the bar high for 2023, Dave, and they didn't quite live up to expectations in 2023 especially early on in the season lost to wyoming and then some losses started to pile up they did finish rather strong so took some of the sting out of things but not exactly the year they wanted to have in lubbock last year yeah and i just wonder what that looks like uh, i mean it, it's got to dial up the pressure a little bit when you go look at the past of coaching tenures in, at texas tech yeah, and it, and it feel like Texas Tech a little bit outside of when even when Leach was there a little bit. It, there's there's a lot of highs and a lot of lows. It, it, the consistency. I mean, Leach did it, sustained it there. I mean, Tommy, Tommy Tuberville couldn't do it. Uh, I mean, Cliff Kingsbury couldn't do it. It's, it looks like it's kind of tough to get some continuity out there, and it's a new Big Twelve, new landscape. It's uh, they've recruited well in the portal. They've recruited well through the high school ranks. This is Joey McGuire's what his third class. He just had this would be his third season. Um, I think the outlook to me, uh, Blaine, for Texas takes a little bit. I like the talent. I think the talent upgrade from a personnel standpoint, they've raised that floor. I like Barry Morton at quarterback. I think the key is going to be how well some of these young cats on the defensive line and that front seven in general, but specifically the defensive line, because I think they got 
two of the better defense. Uh, they get two of the best linebackers in Ben Roberts and Jacob Rodriguez that the Big 12 will have. So that young front seven and that back end, I think, will be key. If those guys can come along uh, towards the middle, late year, they could be in contention to be playing for the Big 12 title in Dallas come early December. I, you tell me if I'm wrong here. I get that feel under Joey McGuire and them. They're going to kind of be like – who could I use here as an example? From an SEC standpoint, you'd be talking maybe like how Auburn was with Gus Malzahn. When, the, when their preseason expectations are there, they may underachieve. Now people probably won't be ranking them as high, and the spotlight won't be on them after a big successful first season. They kind of sneak under the radar, depending on what they do. I mean, I like the defense of what Tim DeRuder. I mean, they've improved at all three years since he's been there. Just those young cats on defense I think will be key by years end. Uh, is Texas Tech playing that Big 12 title game in Joey McGuire's third year? I think Joey McGuire, where where things kind of went off the rails a little bit for Texas, was preseason last year when he went out and said, "Hey, the 2023 team." He said preseason last year, the 2023 team we beat last year's team, the 2022 team by 14 points. Like he really, he didn't back away from it. Some coaches are like, "Hey, you got to go out, you got to play, you got to execute." Joe McGuire was out there kind of pounding his chest a little bit and letting people know. And then you have some injury stuff, and Tyler Shutt wasn't able to to kind of go out and play the the whole season, and you have to. Uh, you have to get out there and then, you know, Morton comes in and he did OK. Listen, the last six games of the year, 62 uh, percent, you know, in, in his starts, he had almost 1800 yards passing, 15 touchdowns to eight interceptions, really played well in the bowl game at the Independence Bowl. He went 27 of 43, 256, three touchdowns and that win over Cal. And listen, Cal. You can say what you want about not, but they, they had a decent defense last year. They they played some good defensive ball, and, and to be able to put up those points, it was a was a big deal. But I think when it comes down to it, you know, there's it, it's it's biblical, right? There's a biblical principle: to whom much is given, much is required. And uh, I think that's what Joey McGuire is facing here, and why I think there is some pressure on him. Is one failed expectations last year. Two, as you mentioned, it they've done that well at the high school ranks. 21 commitments this year out of the 23rd ranked class in the entire country, Dave, and all 21 of those came from inside the state of Texas. So they just said, hey, we're going to recruit in our state and we're going to do a good job with it. And that includes some some high profile guys like Micah Hudson, the receiver that's going to do a really good job. And then they bring in some key transfer portal pieces, especially up front. Uh, Davion, Davion Carter, one of the best guards in the entire portal hall that was out there and available they they battled a, a couple of you know sec teams and, and other teams for his services out of memphis and got him so uh, added another guard as well so you know that's why i say hey i think there is a little bit of pressure when you have that that added talent you mentioned they raised the floor of their talent level and then by doing so i also think the potential was raised a little bit there Oh, no, absolutely. And we've talked about it. We did our Utah video. Obviously, they're moving to the Big 12. The Big 12 with Oklahoma and Texas leaving, in my opinion, totally up for grabs. It's almost like who is going to have sustained success? It, like, who's going to yeah. be that team that gets there outside of Utah? I mean, and Utah did it uh, in the Pac-12, but, again, it's different. I, I think the Big 12 is going to be a blast. I think Texas Tech is going to be right in the thick of things. Um, I do like the industry. I could see them maybe getting off to a little bit slower start. I mean, we're going to talk about it, the schedule. I didn't think it was that difficult, but um, – I think this team with the younger defense, especially in the front on the defensive line in the back end, I think this is going to be a team that gets better as the season goes on. Yeah, for sure. I, I and that's what that's my biggest point here is one another reason that there's pressure over there to win is now you automatically by just by the scenario of Texas and Oklahoma, two blue blood brands that leave your conference and really leave a void there to go and attack. And when you look at this schedule. There is no reason. There is no reason with the talent they brought in, with the experience they have at quarterback in Morton, with some of the playmakers they've had. Listen, Josh Kelly from, from Washington State, okay, that came over in the portal. Listen, he he added – he's a 1,000-yard receiver uh, from a from the Pac-12 that was a good good league last year. So when he comes over, I mean, that – and then you add Micah Hudson and some of these guys, like I said – Look at that. Look at those first five games. I mean, before they go on the road to Arizona, is there any reason that Texas Tech couldn't couldn't be sitting undefeated right there? 
No, I mean, I think that would be that. I'm with you, Blaine. I think it's the expectation. I mean, you should be what, three, four, five, six, I mean, five and oh, right there. I mean, I don't think they should lose to Cincinnati at home at the, at the old at Jones ATT Stadium. They shouldn't lose that game. You're right, at Arizona, but that's also a first year staff. So, I mean, yeah, you can make a really talented nice team. By week. Yeah, yeah, talented team, but still, I don't really see on the schedule for sure loss. Maybe I'm crazy. I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, you're looking at, you're like, yeah, it's a loss. I, I don't really – they will lose it. I'm not saying Texas Tech's going 12-0 and 0 here, but I don't see a for sure loss on that schedule. Do you? No, I mean, I think at uh, going to Ames, Iowa late in the year is tough because Matt Campbell always gets his teams better over the over the yeah. course of the year, no matter how they start. You don't know what Colorado's going to be with all that talent coming in. but that Big that, bounce back year for TCU at TCU. Yeah, it seems like Sonny Dykes is kind of up and down, up and down. So this could be a bounce back year for him. And then at Oklahoma State is is always tough. Boom That's picking. Be so I, the yeah. two hardest games I would say on the schedule right now for them would be Iowa State and and Oklahoma State. But again, just by proxy of you know. Texas and Oklahoma being gone, Dave, I would say that's where most of the pressure comes from. Plus the fact that Joey McGuire brought a lot of energy and kind of overachieved year one. Uh, they, they took a step back year two. We'll see what happens in year three. No, so. absolutely. I think the team that should be one of the few teams in this league that should be fired up with Oklahoma and Texas leaving for them to go get in that next tier in this conference, Texas Tech. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They, people, people don't forget like the lead share was was that far. It wasn't that far ago, okay. And they were and they were winning and and doing doing some good things. You go back and look at those records. I think there's the capability to get back there again. And Joe McGuire can be the type of guy to do it. Now let's talk about the the U, the Miami Hurricanes. Okay, uh, this is a team that. I don't know with Mario Cristobal, man. Sometimes it just feels like you're banging your head against the wall with with. They've got talent. They always recruit well. Holy moly. I just had a power outage. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I do. I, yes. I see you. I hear you. My power, just all of it just flickered right there. So, hey, you know what, you, <laughs> hey, you, know what Jim, you know what Jim Ross said? We're live, pal. And there, there's nothing that can go wrong when you're live, except let me turn my oh, uh, good light old JR. Blazing of the sun. Uh, anyways, I don't know what <laughs> happened there, but. Apologies. Let's go back into Miami. Yeah. The Miami Hurricanes, all right, when when it comes down to it, it just seems like, hey, the recruiting's always there. In the three recruiting classes that have been under Mario Cristobal's tenure, under under his, you know, stewardship there, 13th, 8th, now 5th. So the talent, the talent acquisition is there, Dave. They're, they're able to bring guys in. They brought in Cam Ward out of the, the transfer portal, one of the most high-profile signings is what I'm going to call it in this in this free agency as pool. Um, as a as a guy, you know, formerly in player personnel and things like that, just tell people kind of what Miami is getting in Cam Ward and what that should do for the expectations of the Hurricanes this year. No, I mean, I think that's massive. Uh, I think it's massive for them. That changes the game from that standpoint. I mean, I know Tyler Van Dyke went to Wisconsin – but getting a guy like Cam Ward with a very manageable schedule, I know we're going to talk about it here in a minute, not getting ahead of myself here, but and you, and you got your weapons, Xavier Restrepo and Jacoby George coming back. I, you got in the college level, I think you have to have some guys that when it breaks down for a guy like Shannon Dawson, the OC for Miami, you have to have some guys that can go make some plays and improvise. And we saw that at Washington State next year, last year. And we're in this, we're in the time of college football now. I think you're, Quarterback can no longer just be uh, – I hate using this term, but I'm going to use it because every quarterback's a game manager to some extent. But I think your quarterback now has to be one of your top three or four players on your roster. You just can't kind of manage – be a winnable guy. I think he's got to be that winnable rare guy when you're grading these rosters now. And I think Cam Ward takes this Miami roster to another level. And it's – they've been recruiting well. Again, similar to – we're talking about Joey McGuire. All these teams have something in common. Big years kind of going to these third years – Mario has been – Coach Chris Ball been recruiting very well. Can it translate onto the field? Can we stop seeing the lack of discipline stuff that I think really frustrates Miami fans um, and kind of let the talent go speak for itself? Because I think there's a lot of winnable games on that schedule. And in my opinion, as we stand right now, February 12th, they're a top – I think they may be – if you put my feet to the fire right now, I may take the Canes to be my ACC favorite right now in February. 
Man, yeah, that that would be that would definitely be a big turnaround. Brendan, welcome in, Brendan. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Andy Stowe on here in the comments asked an early lean. Would you take Miami or would you take Florida? They're going to be playing uh, our first game of the season, I believe. So uh, who would you, who would you take? Would you take the Canes or would you take the Gators early on? Yeah, sorry for some technical difficulties, but I would I'm leaning Miami right now. I'm just the way Florida's trending and Miami just the recruiting they've been uh kind of the recruiting hot streak they've been going on the past couple of years with Mario Cristobal. I like the I like my I like Miami's talent better than Florida. I think they're just a better team, period, than Florida right now. And look, when you add Cam Ward, I mean they got the better quarterback in the game. Uh where's that game being played at? In uh, let's look at the schedule in right Gainesville. now. This is okay. at yeah, at the swamp. So that does give a yeah. little bit of advantage there. It, it does. So it Swamp's not an easy place to play. I still lean Miami slightly. It does worry me that Mario is not great in uh, in close games. I'm sure you guys might might have touched on that uh, before. No, not yet. We haven't got to it yet. yet. Uh, we, we're just about to. Yeah, that's definitely a big topic, but I still lean Miami. Yeah, and listen, I will say this. I was one that, that I said, hey, I wouldn't blame – the Miami administration, if they just went out on the field and fired Mario Cristobal after that Georgia Tech game last year, because that was just a dereliction of, of duty. I mean, it was atrocious in how they mishandled the end of that game. All you have to do is take a knee. You take a knee, and the game is over. Totally, totally botched the end of that. There was no reason to run a play. He could absolutely take a knee, and they, they end up fumbling the football and losing that game. And the frustrating thing about that is, is they would go out and lose games like that, and then they'd go beat a Clemson team, you know, or they, they, they'd beat a, a ta even though Texas a and wasn't great record wise. Texas a and was a talented football team, and they'd go out and beat them. Different things like that. So you saw the the pieces were there, but but some of the close games that they did lose, especially ones on the road, just not being able to come out of it, David. I mean, when it comes down to it, you've added these big pieces, you know, out of the portal, like on offense, like Kim Ward. You, you had a, a depth piece at running back in Rodney Hill. And then out of the high school ranks, you already had some talented edge rushers if you're Miami and some talented guys on the defensive line. Well, then you go out and add guys like Justin Scott, a five-star. You add a five-star and Marquise Lightfoot out there, Armando Blount. I mean, all of these guys who are viewed as blue-chip prospects – Miami, it's never been about the talent. It's been about where is that execution, and then also where is the where is the swagger? Where is the belief that you are the you? Miami used to win games getting off the bus, Dave, just because teams were intimidated by them. No, I agree. I think you hit on it just a minute ago a little bit, Blaine. It, it always felt like it was like one step forward, two step backs, even when you had like Al Golden there. I, I worked at Miami that year with him. It was we went and beat Florida – in a big win over Will Muschamp and them. And then you come back and you lose to Virginia Tech back and Virginia Tech and Duke back to back weeks. It's it's stuff like that. You talked about it. I mean, they beat AM uh, and then they go lose to Georgia Tech when they're undefeated in a game they had no business losing. And then the next week they back it up with a loss. I know North Carolina was solid, but they back it up with a double digit loss to to North Carolina. Then they win two good games against Clemson and Virginia then lose three straight to NC State. Florida State's nothing to shot at. But then Louisville, I mean, it, it's just kind of – it's stuff like that. And they lose their bowl game to Rutgers in the uh, Bad Boy Motors pinstripe bowl. But it's, it's like it, – I think if I was a Miami fan, I'd want to see some consistency because I think it start like you said, talent hadn't really been the issue. And I think now with the ACC and the way Mario's recruited, I think anyone who follows college football knows Mario Cristobal's biggest strength is his ability to recruit. Wherever he's been is an assistant coach, head coach at Oregon – now back at his alma mater at Miami, his ability to obtain the best of the best, especially in the Southeast, South Florida region where he's at now, has been his biggest streak. Not really his game day or organization throughout the building on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think people are like, look, the ACC is a little down. Florida State lost a lot. We had a lot more production than back. We're really probably facing Louisville, but hey, let's don't go beat Louisville and then go drop a game at Virginia the next week. I think that's where we're a little bit at with Miami as a program overall. Yeah, for sure. I think it's a deal where, you know, I say it all the time, the true measure of greatness is consistency. Before you have consistency, you're not going to have anything else. So you, you've got to be able to uh, just understand 
when when certain situations are going on, it's like the, with the Chiefs and the 49ers in the Super Bowl. The players were talking about one team had been talking about the overtime rules for two weeks. One team didn't know them. I feel like sometimes the the Miami Hurricanes fall more towards that 49ers deal of things. They don't know what's coming. They, they aren't educated enough uh, to, to be able to respond in a confident manner to a situation. And a lot of that falls on coaching. Um, real quick question for you here, Brendan, from – uh, Andy Stowe, which team has a better head coach right now, Florida? I think that's a great question. I mean, we touched on Crystal Ball's kind of in-game kind of coaching decisions, but man, Billy Napier's record at Florida is not great at all. So I would I would still lean towards Crystal Ball. I know he's not great in crunch time, not good at uh, kind of making decisions on the fly there. Even common better sense recruiter. decisions like at Georgia Tech, but better recruiter than Napier. I, I did like what Napier did at Louisiana, but Crystal Balls has won games at whether it be at Oregon or now at my air. He didn't, he's done an all right job at Miami, maybe a little bit slower start than most of us expected, but he still had an over 500 record in most of his seasons that he's coached Napier. I don't know if we can say the same, especially at Florida. So I still lean Chris ball as the better coach. Yeah, I would say so. And, and listen, the thing about it was, is that, it was a vacuum in the state of Florida there for a while. Like nobody was really good. And then finally Florida state stepped up and took, took control of things last year. We'll see if Miami can get back in it, but I do think there's pressure. You can't go 12 and 13 in your first two years at Miami and just think that's acceptable. I just, I just don't think that, that especially with some of the debacles you had in close losses that, you didn't really – the other team didn't beat you. You lost the game. You you gave it away in certain cases. Let's look at the schedule here. In terms of determining, you know, how much pressure there is, you got to kind of look at some of where these games are, who you're playing. We know Florida at Florida, regardless of if they're up or down, is always – it's rivalry. It's always a, a, a tough, tough environment to go play in. But then I think you have a stretch of, you know, five games there that if you are who you hope to be as Miami, you win those games. You go out and win those because I mean, Dave, am I wrong uh, in terms of games two through six there? No, yeah, I think Cal, like you mentioned a little bit, Cal's better on defense. That could be a tough, but still, if that, like you said, if Miami's where they think they should be heading into year four with Mario, uh, what is it? Yeah, year, year three, year, year three. three, year three, year three with Mario, they should win that game at Cal. But again, that, that could be a little bit of a challenge. But you're right, they're two games, they're season. Is going to come down to that October 19th matchup in the very next week, October 26th, against the in-state rival at Florida State. And I think these Miami fans, as they should, I think it's, hey, Florida State had their season last year. They went undefeated, arguably could have made the playoffs, won the ACC. But, hey, guys, they lost a lot, and we have a lot back. We have probably the second most production returning in the ACC next year. I think outside of Virginia Tech, I think Miami has it. It's our time. Like, especially we get them at home. They shouldn't be coming to the 305 or as they used to say, the OB, the Orange Bowl, and beating us there. I think it's just kind of my – the schedule is not very difficult to me outside of those two first two games. And obviously Florida, I think Billy, I think Napier and them will come out hot like they did. They always kind of start off a little strong. I know they lost to Utah last year, but the year before they came out in his first game beat a solid Utah team at home. So I expect both those teams – that will be one of the better matchups of that opening weekend. But I think season really does come down to those – uh, those games at Louisville and, and Florida State. And then, like I mentioned earlier, how do you – say you go 2-0, and 1-1 one and one in those two games. How do you handle that matchup against Duke and at Georgia Tech the next two weeks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's there's several games that – and you did a great job of pointing them out in the SEC in a video that we have on the archives. But Miami has some, some trap games here that I think they're going to be the more talented team. And especially, Brennan, and I talked about some of that, that recruiting class I think some of those young guys, where, where where you see some of the great teams is, you know, think of Georgia in the in twenty one and twenty two, and think of you know some of those those Alabama team teams that have been went on and won national titles. It's been because they've been able to bring pressure and also bring just energy up front along their front seven in waves like two three deep uh, coming in there i think that's what justin scott who's going to be a mid-year not a mid-year uh january but he's not going to get there till fall camp so it may take him a little while but by the end of the year five-star guy him uh lightfoot blount those guys could all be contributors i think by the by the end of things and really add to that depth and give them some give them some added added energy there towards the end of the season 
Yep. Yeah, and they added three transfers along the defensive line as well. Uh, they got C.J. Clark from NC State. They got a decent G5 guy, uh, Marley Cook from Middle Tennessee, and uh, uh, Elijah Alston's from Marshall State. So they got depth, I think, at the defensive line position. And if you want to pull up that schedule once more, Blaine, if you don't mind, uh, I think that this depth, this might be, you know, when I say this, it might you might question it a little bit, but look at the game at Cal at Georgia Tech, those two games. Cal, that's their sixth straight game. No bye week before that. It's so they play six games in a row. Cal's that last game. That's a far road trip. That's yeah. coast to coast. I think we'll learn a lot about the depth of this Miami team in that game and the Georgia Tech game. It's not a far road trip to Atlanta, but they're coming off games against Louisville, against Florida State, against Duke, or excuse me, Duke. So, and those are three of the teams we would imagine would be near the top of the ACC. Uh, so, I think their depth along the offense line, along the defense line, I think will really know a lot about this team at Cal, at Georgia Tech. Two games that they should win, but we'll see. Yeah, and, and two other th- things that are interesting about those. How about the fact that Cal is a dang conference game now? Okay, that's a, yeah. that's a conference game. And then uh, Georgia Tech, guys, we saw with Georgia Tech towards the end of the year, they're one of the more physical teams when it comes to the run game and what Buster Faulkner does. So that's going to be interesting there. So no gimmies for sure. They bring back on the offensive side. We've talked about the the receivers and and, and Cam Ward, of course, how big that's going to be. But they bring back two headed monster in Mark Fletcher and Henry Parrish, who who you know combined for over a thousand yards last year. They got Rodney Hill coming in from Florida State. That's going to add uh, add a depth piece there for them. And then they they were able to bring in bring back a lot on the offensive line. They bring in Zach Carpenter over from Indiana to be the the center. So kind of fortify things in the middle there. That's why I think. Hey, expectations should be higher for Miami. Haven't seen the schedule and what all the factors we talked about. What do you guys think would be success and kind of keep the pressure off of Cristobal um, after this 2024 season? What what do you how many games do you think they need to win and for in order for that to happen? I never really want to say someone has to win double digits. I think nine. They got to get nine. I think they should get to double digits, but I'm going to factor in like. Vernon was saying maybe that trip at Cal, maybe that trip to Georgia Tech after two I – mean, it's not right after two of those Louisville and Florida State games, yet Duke sandwiched in between, but something like that. Something like that. I don't know. Maybe they go into that last game of the regular season up at Syracuse, and uh, Fran Brown has his team more comfortable late in the year up and up. Right State Syracuse team. Comfortable. Yeah. So, I mean, I would say nine, to be fair to them. I mean, it's tough to make that big of a jump. But again, if there was a year to do it in the ACC, I think they got, like I said, I think they got the second most production level back. They get Virginia Tech at home. I don't think double digits is outside the realm, but I'll go with nine. Brennan, is it more, uh, is it more maybe about what games they win and instead of the the number of like which ones they win, you know, got to get a couple of those key ones? Yeah, sure. I mean, they always want to beat Florida State. That's their big rival. And then that Florida game's huge as well. Uh, but I do think Mario does buy himself a little bit more breathing room because he's recruiting so well. I mean, if he goes seven and six again, they're not going to they're not going to get rid of him just becoming I mean, because he's in the top five of recruiting this year. But I do think he needs to show s- some progress on the field. So I'll, I'll say eight wins, uh, but really nine wins would really make me feel confident with Mario going forward. So I think nine wins really should be the goal this season for Miami. Yeah, I mean, with Cam Ward at quarterback, there's a lot to expect there now let's move our attention over to the sec you can see right here behind me the south carolina gamecocks and shane beamer guys uh shane beamer is a lightning rod in many aspects okay because lots of people love the antics of gamecocks fans some of them really enjoy the energy he brings there's lots of talk about culture and family and things along those lines and then there's other times where think when things don't go South Carolina's way, there seems to be some almost tantrums thrown in press conferences and and some some different things like that. There's been some ups and downs in terms of guys, you know, leaving. You had Jaheim uh, Bell and Mar- Marshawn Lloyd that that left the program after, uh, you know, before this past season. They were decimated by injury along the offensive front and really didn't give Spencer Rattler, who I think was one of the more, and we saw it play out at the Senior Bowl, one of the more improved and and talented and gutsy quarterbacks in all of the college football really over the last season and a half. And when it came down to it, his efforts were kind of of wasted almost because they, they, 
they didn't have but really one target to throw to at receiver, and they couldn't protect him as well. So, Dave, we're, we're looking here at a 20-18 and 18 record going into uh, the fourth season here for Shane Beamer. The exact same record that Will Muschamp had going into his fourth season. So, for all the talk that it's better, it's better, it, it seems different, the results are the same. What are your thoughts on the pressure that is on Shane Beamer going into this fourth season? I think unless they're just horrendous this year, he's going to get to 25 from people I've talked to over there said that Ray Tanner's told him. They, and, again, people have made empty promises before. But I think they would give him 25 unless it's like a three- or four-win season and it's just some debacle out there. But you're right. I, suppose, I mean, Jake Crane was on my show last week, and he was at the Senior Bowl. We were talking about it. Spencer Rattler was probably the MVP of the league last year. Imagine how bad South Carolina would have been without him. It was almost like he was a uh, pitcher on, like, hypothetically, I see the Braves logo, the Braves pitcher, almost like a Max Freed goes out there and he loses games two to one because his offense didn't give it him any support. It's kind of what you felt like with Spencer Rattler running for his life out there, a little undersized. And his first year he had some issues. But, again, I think this year they like Lenore Sellers. They're going to roll with him. Um Again, when's the last time South Carolina had a good offensive line? I think like we didn't talk. Yeah. They've been so bad. They've been bad either just personnel wise, or they just if had a bunch of injuries and their depth's been taking a sh- is taking shots before. It's been such a long time. It's funny we're talking about Spencer Rattler. I feel like Will Muschamp could never hit on a big quarterback. They had some other talent around there, but yeah, I think this year he's going to be fine. I think with the over under, what Vegas come out with was it five and a half for South Carolina? Five and a half. Yeah, I'd probably go under right now if I had to predict. But uh, I, I just think there's got to be some improvement. I think Len- how good Lenore Sellers looks is key. If they see yeah. a young kid they have and they feel like he's their future, uh, you kind of like where they're going. But if it comes out there, it's with um, – uh, oh, my God, I'm forgetting his name. If I say, but if he just goes out there and doesn't look great, I think in their changing quarterbacks all the time, yeah. Bobby like Ashford. A lot of moaning and groaning going on in Columbia, especially heading into 25. That was a move that surprised me a little bit. With as 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 in as they in are on Lenore Sellers, like everybody's saying this, there's no question it's gonna be Lenore Sellers for Robbie Ashford to leave a situation in Auburn that he was having to really just kind of take whatever playing time Hugh Freeze was allowed to give him and then kind of go to what I think is going to be the same situation for him, Brendan, in, at South Carolina with Lenore Sellers being QB1. I mean, it, do you think this just has more to do with, hey, where they're planning on using Lenore Sellers' legs and they had to have a viable option in case he gets banged up? I mean, what what are your thoughts on on that move? Uh, because that was that was a little bit of a head-scratcher for me. Yeah, I mean, getting Robbie Ashford for depth is not a, a bad pickup. I mean, they also got uh, Davis Bevel from Oklahoma, so they have options who have played college football before, especially Ashford has more experience than Bevel. Uh, but, yeah, I don't hate the pickup from a standpoint of we need to establish depth behind our starting quarterback. And I do think Shane Beamer, I think he's going to go as far as Lenora Sellers takes him because that's his prized possession right now. That's his prized recruit. I think Shane Beamer is going to have to – kind of ride the coattails of Sellers, see how far he takes them. I think his his kind of job security really depends on Sellers' potential, what he shows this year, as Dave kind of alluded to. Yeah, I yeah, think Al and- Loggins is going to have to be making his money this year. Don't you think? He's going to be earning it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, mu- how much of that that was being called last year was just Spencer Rattler doing great at improv and being able to take over things, you know, because – uh, he's not the fastest guy in the world, but he he made some things happen uh, and escaped some trouble. You know when he could escape trouble because they were banged up. Now, you know people want to talk about the offensive line. I do think the offensive line will be better. You couldn't be worse, okay? Because they were they were absolutely uh, just pummeled in terms of the injuries. But my question is is you know yes, a lot of guys played at different times, but it was so many different lineups. Dave, you know as well as I do. It's not just, okay, these guys have experience. A lot of the offensive line, you have to have that experience together because you have to be able to understand how this guy is going to pass this off to you. And also, if we have to adjust this protection, are we communicating this well back and forth, up and down the line? Who's setting the protections? Do they trust Lenora Sellers to – 
to go out there as a first-time starter in the SEC with all he's going to have added to him probably in the run game as well and be able to adjust protections, or is the center going to have to do it? I mean, there's so many questions when it comes up front and and health being the chief one among them, which they seem to at least have that going in their favor going into spring ball right now. No, I mean, he's well, like you said, the offensive line can only be improved. And think about it. Who's going to step up on the outside for him? I mean, yeah, Juice Wells was hurt all year. Now he's not on campus either. He's in. He's at Ole Miss. Yet Xavier Leggett's going. Now it's like, can a raw athletic prospect who who has all the ability, high one of the higher ceilings in the country, in Nick Harbor? He's a track kid though, but it can't. At heart, he's a heart. At heart, he's a track and field kid. But can he transition and learn the nuances of that wide wide receiver position, um, and take that next step to be Lenore Sellers? Is, number one guy because they're going to need somebody to step up. Brendan, I do think that they get a valuable piece out of the portal in um, in Jared Brown, the receiver from Coastal Carolina. We've talked about these group of five guys, especially guys out of the Sun Belt. Okay, He was productive, Brendan, and I think that he can be a guy that, that Lenore Sellers will – will be able to to target. Of course, Luke Doty's still there playing receiver for him as well, but going to be a p- more possession-type guy. But Nick Harbour's going to take take the top off. I don't think he's – I think he's got to learn to be a more complete receiver. I think Doty can be that guy that kind of, like I said, is a possession guy. I think Jared Brown is really that X factor for this offense when it comes to the, the passing game. Yeah, and I will give Shane Beamer a lot of credit for what he did in the transfer portal this offseason. He recognized kind of the issues at wideout – uh, with all the talent he was losing, whether it be Juice Wells, whether it be Leggett, and he went out and got guys like like you mentioned, the coastal kid, uh, Mari Huggins Bruce is from Louisville. He was a solid player uh, this past season, so he got a number of guys at the skill positions, running back as well. Got a new running backs yeah. coach, so replaced him. There's some a little bit of staff turnover, but I do think uh, it's for the better in terms of transfer portal pickups, the staff turnover. So I'm going to give Shane Beamer a ton of credit for kind of recognizing those is- those issues and uh, making a change. No doubt, and and you mentioned Rocket Sanders. Listen, that that is Lenore Sellers' best friend, okay? Because if he can be the Rocket Sanders Dave from 2022 and not from 2023 at Arkansas, where he can be healthy, in my estimation, you know, it was right there one A one B with Quinshaw Judkins that year for being the best running back in the SEC. And you add a, a, a offensive line that does have more experience, that that does have some more depth to it, and should be able to, to lean on people a little bit at certain times, particularly with the threat of the, the running back pull. That's something that that's something that Rocket Sanders benefited from at Arkansas was that people had to worry about KJ Jefferson running the ball too. Well, Lenore Sellers is like a carbon copy almost of of KJ Jefferson in terms of size and athleticism, all that kind of stuff. David, do you think that that Rocket Sanders and then also a couple of other running back additions that they made can can get this running game going because they had virtually no ability to run the football the last two seasons for South Carolina? Yeah, I mean, we talk about the offensive line. That's where it starts. But running back room depth specifically, you're talking about, Blaine. But remember, they had the kid with the Newberry College, the Mario Anderson kid last year. They didn't, And I'm one of those guys, I kind of think you can win with a lot of running backs. But bringing in a yeah. guy that is proven in the SEC he can be productive in Rocket Sanders – it can only help. Because, again, who they lost? They brought in Mario Anderson last year, and they lost um, uh, Marshawn Lloyd over to USC. Yeah, so they lost some guys. Again, not a good running back room last year. They had to play to and Joyner. They had to move him back there and running back. So it was one of the Juju thin running back. Yeah, Juju McDowell, who's not an every-down guy. He was a 5'8", 185, kind of scat back, third-down guy. You, you feel better about the, the the room this year for sure, right, that running back room. A guy like Rocket Sanders, a proven veteran in this league that has proven production – can't obviously can obviously only help you yeah and Oscar no, I, Attaway I, I, had a good couple seasons at North Texas so he's not yeah, a bad option yeah. as that's, a backup as well I don't know that's sorry, the guy that I was, under there yeah that's the guy that I, I was think South Carolina you'll tell me wrong they're one of those teams in the SEC too and it's hard to predict this and I talk about it with buddy like you can't predict injuries, but again, we always talk about it. it's not your top 22 it's your top 40 depth in general like it's tough to just predict them overall I mean I kind of like them on defense a little bit too. They're starting to level. I mean, I like both safeties and more than uh, and I like DQ Smith. But if either of those guys get hurt, they don't have any depth on the back. I, yeah. Same with their front, I like Tonka Hemingway and Alex Huntley too. But if those guys get hurt, there's not a lot of depth. I, I, I like I, this is a big year for Beamer, but I will say the thing I think he's failed at a little bit that hadn't helped him, and we're getting I'm getting off topic. I'm sorry, Blaine, is 
I don't like the assistant coaches hires he's had. I don't think yeah. there are a lot of closers. I think that's why he kind of got rid of Mar Mario uh, Montario hardest. I think he got tired of that's why that running back room guy should never got that bad. But I think well, and Justin Justin Stepp, who's been with him since day one, just leaves it. I don't think people realize how big of a loss that is in terms of the the, the culture that you're saying in South Carolina. Justin Stepp was a big part of that. He did a great job of helping to to mold that that team in terms of the morale and all that kind of stuff. A really really talented young guy that goes to Illinois to be the the receivers coach over there. You mentioned depth on the defense, Brendan. That they added Kyle Kennard on the edge, and I think from Georgia Tech, he's a guy that at 6'5", 240, I mean, he's the prototype edge body, and I think he can be productive for South Carolina in in an area where they where they they need some production out there on the edge. Yeah, you said they need more production at, at, along the defensive line, kind of as a whole. Um, Kennard had six sacks, I think it was last year, eleven tackles for loss. So he was a very productive guy at Georgia Tech. And I mean, you know, the game is one loss up front, right? I mean, again, he's going out, going to be going up. You look at the schedule, a bunch of really good offensive lines, whether it be Bama, Oklahoma, AM's got some talent, Clemson's got some talent, LSU's got some talent. So, I mean, South Carolina, the depth is obviously a concern, addressing it a little bit in the portal. Beamer has this, this offseason, so it'll really be tested this year with that schedule. It is tough. Yeah, and, and it starts with Old Dominion. Listen, do not do not just think Old Dominion is going to come in there and lay down, okay? Like I said, that Sun Belt teams are tough, and they, they, they're going to come in and play tough. They beat Virginia Tech, what was it, last year, the year before? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, not, not, a, not a bad team. Then you got to go on the road to Kentucky. Always tough to go up to Lexington and play. Uh, LSU, we know what that is. Akron, that should be an easy win. So let's say at worst, let's – for their case, you got to hope you're two and two going through there. And then, my goodness, probably, that don't, gone. Don't maybe I'm wrong here. What do y'all think? I think they probably need to be three and one. Actually, I mean, if yeah. you're really trying to feel decent about your season in those first four, like, whoo. Yeah, because look at the next three, Dave. I mean, that's a murderer's row right there with Ole Miss, all the talent they brought in, Alabama at Bryant Denny, and then at back to back at Bryant Denny, and then at at Norman, Oklahoma, uh, to take on the Sooners. Those are going to be two just terrific environments that you have to go into that are going to be just jumping over there. And you know you know that that's going to just take a toll on you after playing a, uh, an Ole Miss team, even at home, an Ole Miss team that is already going to be one of the best in the country. No, actually, I mean, I, I'm asking – uh, you and Brennan here. We talked to we talked about we talked about Texas Tech. We talked about Miami schedule. I saw a bunch of very winnable games on both those schedules. It's kind of the opposite to me here. I mean, you know, going through the schedule, guys, how many would y'all say? All right, all right, it's a win. I'm with Blaine here. I wouldn't say Old Dominion right off the bat. They should win. I mean, they got almost have to win that game. I wouldn't say it's a guarantee. I mean, Akron, uh, I mean, at Akron, Andy, maybe I put Andy that and Wofford. I see four that they really should win. That they yeah, need to win. Yeah. That's four. I mean, every they'll probably be underdogs in every other game. Yeah, it's going to be that. That I think that's why the pressure comes in. I'm not saying that people are expecting Shane Beamer's team to win eight or nine games this year, but I'm saying I think when you're at South Carolina and you have, you know, not met the 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 hype that was kind of there was a lot of South Carolina hype going into 2023. A lot of people had expectations. As, particularly with how they ended 2022 mm -hmm. with the blowout win over Tennessee and, and with the win over Clemson. There was a lot of energy that was built up, a lot of equity that Shane Beamer had or had kind of built up. And then, you know, much like Texas Tech, they kind of fall flat in 2023. Now you've got – you're really searching for wins on that schedule. And I think the expectations are high because they think, okay, well, we're recruiting at a decent level. We're bringing in transfers at a decent level. The administration is, you know – they're they're investing in football. They're providing facility, all this kind of stuff. You better go out and win, and, and it's going to be hard to do with that kind of schedule. Um, so I think there is pressure on South Carolina, and going from one USC on the east to another USC on the west. Let's talk about the USC, the Southern Cal Trojans, who go from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten this year. Not the year that Lincoln Riley thought he was going to have when Caleb Williams coming back as the as the high, reigning Heisman Trophy winner, uh, and you know it just did not go their way at all. The defense continued to be a a, a real problem, and Brennan, it's just uh, it's just 
I think it to the point where, hey, now you're going into a new conference. I wonder if the administration, how much they've talked to him and said, hey, we don't want to embarrass ourselves with all these big national profile games. Or do they say, hey, we understand that it's going to take you uh, a year or two to kind of get your Big Ten legs under you. Yeah, I think they need to be a little bit patient, especially, I mean, looking at all the staff changes, they're really starting, uh, kind of starting over, really. I mean, you look at just the staff changes on the defense alone. I mean, those uh, they had four, four staff changes. Danton Lynn coming in as the new D.C., Matt Entz, North Dakota State head coach, now the linebackers coach. Doug Belk is going to be the DB's coach. Eric Henderson, defensive line coach. So they have four new coaches just on the defensive side coming over. It's a lot of coaching staff turnover. I do think it's going to be for the better in the long run, but I mean, will it hurt them here this season? I mean, we'll see definitely a tougher schedule being in the big 10. I mean, you got Michigan on it. Uh, you got Wisconsin, you got Penn state, uh, Notre Dame. I know that's not a big 10 opponent, but it's going to be a tough game as well. So I think they need to be administration at USC needs to be a little bit patient here. Uh, but overall, I do like the direction of USC in the long run. Dave, I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of you, you like you got that background in player personnel and, you know, being a a stout defense is important in the Big Ten and USC, they ain't got it. Uh, they At least they haven't the last couple of years. Do you feel like just the style of play in the Big Ten is going to be have to be something that Lincoln Riley is going to have to change a little bit about his philosophy and also about how he goes about building out a roster? Yeah, I mean, first, I want to give Lincoln Riley credit. Willing to let Alex Grinch go, who came over with him from Oklahoma. Uh, and I think he hired a, a great, as good as a DC as he could get. I mean, Brennan talked about it. The Anton Land uh, improved the UCLA defense uh, from finishing 87th in 2022 to finishing 11th uh, overall, just in total defense last year. Thought he did a phenomenal job. He mentioned Matt Ince, North Carolina, no, sorry, North Dakota State inside backer coach. I think he hired an overall. Good defensive staff. My only question is, and as all we as we know, Brennan brought it up too. The schedule is going to get tougher. We go into the Big Ten. How the weather's going to get colder? <laughs> correct. Those late games in November. We'll talk about the schedule here in a minute. But how good is the actual personnel on that side of the ball? I think they've improved from a coaching standpoint, and he should be applauded for that. But I don't know at the end of the day, especially heading into this twenty twenty four season how good that personnel is like just the California kind of mindset is everybody thinks quarterback seven on seven skill guys. We don't really think nasty front seven defensive interior defensive linemen inside backers, few edge rushers here and there. I just don't know if that person, that type of player in that region of the country fits kind of what you were saying, Blaine, that hard nose. Hey man, we may have to go win a game, uh, in Iowa City to go clinch the Big Ten in 16-degree weather when it's snowing at some point. That's a different mindset than what those yeah. kids face in California. I think the person – I think, like I said, I think the staff, the defensive staff, great hires across the board there. I just question the personnel overall on the defensive side of the ball, really. Well, you know, and you see it. It's not just USC. You saw it in the NFL playoffs when the Miami Dolphins had to go to Kansas City in freezing uh, temperatures. You know, it's just different when you got that that utopian weather and you have to go to. So it's something that you can't, can't really simulate it. Yeah, you can't. You can only turn the AC and the indoor down so much. You know, to to get you ready for it. But Brendan, I did want to ask you going back to the offensive side of the ball. We know how much of a offensive genius that Lincoln Riley is and that how much he's able to prepare quarterbacks. Miller Moss stepped in there in that bowl game and just absolutely went nuts in the, in the bowl game for USC. But then they bring in Jaden Maivia, who is a superstar in the making with what he did as a, as a freshman there at UNLV. Do you think that's going to be an open competition, or do you think Miller Moss did enough uh, in the in the bowl game to say, "Hey, uh, you know, it's it's his job unless unless my via just really starts out playing in practice over the long haul." I think it should be an open competition, that's for sure. I mean, Moss, look, I think he threw six touchdowns in that bowl game, so performed really well. Uh, but that was also a one game sample size. My was played. Uh, I think he was a starter for a majority of the season at UNLV, led him to the Mountain West Championship game. So he's a heck of a quarterback in his own right. I think it'll be interesting to watch. I'm sure we'll touch on this in future videos, but this quarterback battle is going to be interesting to watch with Maeva, with Moss, because uh, whoever starts, I think, has a lot of upside, a lot. Of, both guys have talent. 
ton of talent. Of course, they're getting coached by Lincoln Riley, who's one of the best minds for offense in the country. So I do think whoever they go with, they will be fine offensively. Defense, again, is the main going to be the main concern. As far as whichever quarterback it is, they'll have another SEC transplant and somebody who I think is very, very good for this. We talk about physicality in the Big Ten. There's some physicality when you talk about Woody Marks, Jaquavius Woody Marks from Mississippi State coming in, Dave. He's a guy who I really at times early on when Mississippi State last year was – for some reason, just trying to go anti what they were under Leach and just run the rock. I mean, and Woody Mark showed that he he could be a physical runner in between the tackles. No, I, I like that addition. I'm not really worried about their offense. Obviously, it's not going to be as productive as it was with Caleb Williams and those guys, but I don't think they're going to not win the Big Ten or finish in the top three or four of the Big Ten because of their offense. I, I think, obviously, the production is going to go down a little bit, but I do like some of the transfer portal additions. You brought up Woody Marks. I think he's helping a – real uh, physical between the tackles type style of play there that will uh, help USC overall in offense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a deal where I, you're always going to score points. How good can you be in the other phases of the game if you are USC? And, and like I said, I don't know how many of these guys that are coming in in their high school class and, and things of that nature that they'll – actually you know need to, to play right off the bat uh, i think it's going to be more about figuring out that that quarterback position finding the guy going with him and then letting all that talent assimilate around it but i'm fascinated to see how this schedule plays out for usc let's go ahead and look at that um, as we get started and my goodness uh as if the big 10 wasn't hard enough now you got to face out in las vegas which you do have the benefit of being at least closer than lsu but you got to face the LSU Fighting Tigers who come in, and I think LSU is going to be markedly better on defense because uh, you couldn't be any worse than they were last year. But with Blake Baker coming in and then Garrett Nussmeyer, who has been in – it's not as if he's a new guy. He's been in that program a lot. He's actually played a lot uh, for them. Um, I think that yeah, that's as tough of an opening game as you can have maybe in the – Maybe in the country, guys. I mean, they, you got Georgia Clemson that, that week and stuff like that. But LSU – uh, for USC is going to be a tough one. No, I know absolutely right off the bat. I think it's a that's probably the most important game of the weekend for both both teams breaking in a, to the top quarterbacks in the country. I mean, Jaden Daniels, LSU will be the loss of Jaden Daniels with Garrett Nussmeyer. They'll be breaking him in as you mentioned. And Caleb Williams, whoever takes over for him, will be breaking in. So that'll be kind of a springboard game for both. And then we're looking at it. What two of your first three? Then you go at Michigan. You go to the Big House three weeks later. I mean. You're right. This is one of the tougher schedules as well. I mean, eight, nine wins would be a real a solid season. I think nine would be solid. Only eight, I think, would be a little disappointed. But that's a lot of tough games with some teams that, I mean, how good's Washington going to be with a new staff? Can Nebraska take that next step? UCLA's got a new staff. I mean, can Marcus Freeman kind of take that next step and get in that next tier? I know that's late November. But, again, a lot of games, Penn State coming there. Right? There's a lot of toss-up games, in my opinion, on the schedule. Yeah, and don't forget uh, that second game. Don't don't sleep on that yeah. either. Utah State plays good football, and Bryson Barnes, who was the starter at Utah last yeah. year, who's had big moments in Los Angeles when he came in the Rose Bowl against uh, Ohio State a couple years ago. He'll be the quarterback there. My question is: Is what if you're in Big Ten play and you 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 know you you lose a close one to LSU you got to go on the road to Michigan you're sitting at one and two and then all of a sudden the physical Wisconsin team comes in that's going into year two under uh, Luke Fickle there and, and they come in and, and do some things and oh by the way not that it's going to help uh, in terms of the defensive scheme and it may, USC may actually feel more confident but Alex Grinch is now on that Wisconsin staff so if there's a guy that knows that Lincoln Riley offense pretty well and knows some of that personnel pretty well it would be him but Brennan, I mean, how worried are you in terms of, okay, here's where USC is. Here's where they were a couple of years ago. They took a step back. Here's where they need to be. And now you've got this schedule who it, it does have a little bit of a let up at certain points, you would think. But, man, uh, there, there's some games there where you're you're looking at, okay, uh, what what is this going to look like? I mean, what would you put – if you had to rate a concern level from 1 to 10, where would you say it is for USC going into 2024? Ooh, out of 10, I would say either a 4 or 5 
probably a little somewhat concerned given what happened last year. And now they were losing Caleb Williams, obviously a quarterback. So a little bit of concern there at the quarterback position and defense is still a concern, even with the new staff changes. And you look at that schedule, there's no cupcake there. I mean, we touched on Utah state. That's not a bad football team at all. And then look at that big 10 schedule, uh, play Michigan. I know it's a new staff, but there's still going to be a good team, talented team. I think Wisconsin, Minnesota, Penn state, Maryland, Rutgers, Washington, Nebraska, UCLA, and Notre Dame in the non-conference and Oh, and LSU to start the season. There's no easy game on that schedule. And, but one area where I do think they did catch a break is we kind of mentioned them going into colder weather in maybe late November or even just November in general, they don't play a, uh, a traditional big 10 team on the road in November. I mean, they yeah. play Maryland October 19th, but it doesn't get super cold there. I mean, Washington might be a little cold, but they're a traditional Pac-12 team. They've been a conference opponent of USC's for a while. So I think they do they do avoid that, So, which is a little bit favorable for them. But again, no easy games on the schedule at all. Yeah, that is a big break, I think. It may be a little rainy on you up there in Washington on uh, November, <laughs> November 2nd, but other than that, it, it, it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Dave, I guess I will, and we'll wrap up with this on USC – do you think that Lincoln Riley, I know you said he's made good hires, but do you think it's a deal where teams take on the, the, the mentality and the reflection of their coach? Do you think he has to just totally change some things in terms of how the, the programs run on the day to day to make it seem like grit, toughness, and, you know, physicality on that defensive side is, is a, is a priority in this program for them to ultimately have success? Yeah, I hear the practice structure. They may change that a little bit. But I think, again, it goes back to their personnel. I mean, maybe trying to figure out exactly what they want to take, who they want to have to take, because I think it limits their misses. And I don't think they've had that even going back to their time at Oklahoma. That's why they were so poor on defense for a while with when they had Kyler Murray. They were putting up points on everybody. But in the playoffs, Alabama and two of them were scoring on every drive. Like, I think at some point he needs to sit there in the offseason. There's no better time than February when it's dead kind of figure out, obviously, too late for the 24 class, but for the 25 and 26, like, hey, from a DNA standpoint, we're moving to the Big Ten. What do we want to be defensively? What, what do we want to be from a personnel body type standpoint? I don't think they're that structured from an organization from what they really want because I think Lincoln Riley's kind of just hung out in the offensive staff room. I think he probably needs to get more of that little CEO approach and kind of have a 35,000-foot view of everything going in inside of his program. Because I think this is a big year for him. They're moving to a new conference. Schedules got a lot of toss-ups, as we were talking about. If he can get – I don't think they got to win the Big Ten this year. They could somehow get to nine, show some improvement, especially on the defensive side of the ball, because I think the offense is going to be there. Kind of – not kind of, start recruiting better personnel-wise uh, from a, on a defensive standpoint, getting more guys up front on the defensive line, some glass eaters down there. I think people would be like, all right, he, he's kind of made some change again, but take a step back a little bit from just being that offensive head coach and kind of be more of the CEO of the entire organization. Yeah, maybe my biggest concern is can you get a little bit bigger of a play call? I'm afraid you're going to lose this little piece of paper that he has at this size. He has his, equipment guy probably finds it in the laundry after every game. You lose that, man. You're, you're in trouble. But, guys, this has, this has been, we're wrapping up here on USC. Uh, lots of concern, you know, in my in my opinion, going from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten. But, hey, the talent is there. The coaching adjustments are there. So we'll see how USC does in 2024. Leave your comments, guys. Subscribe. Turn on notifications. We're going to go live here each Monday night, and then we'll have videos coming out all throughout the week. You can follow us on social media at CFBpod.com, okay? Or also you see all of our individual uh, handles here on X right here on the screen. So guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Like, subscribe, leave your comment to be greatly appreciated. God bless you all. And we'll catch you next time to talk more college football. Cause that's all we do here at the CFB pod.com show is talk college football all year round. Brendan's going to be keeping the blog up to date over there on the website. We'll, we'll have that going. So thank you so much. Like I said, God bless you. And we'll catch you guys later on to talk more college football.